coming up on Path to Zero. I also don't believe that we're going to solve climate change. I just believe that we are going to get better at managing and thinking about how we have a portfolio of solutions. Welcome to a special edition of Path to Zero, recorded from the Reuters Global Energy Transition Summit in New York City. Now, here's your host, Tucker Perkins. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Dr. Carolyn Kassan. She's a leading authority in the field of energy and climate policy. Dr. Kassan serves as the Associate Dean of the graduate programs in Global Affairs and Global Security, Conflict, and Cybercrime at NYU. She's also the founding director of the NYU Energy, Climate Justice, and Sustainability Lab. Carolyn, it's so nice to have you with us in New York on Path to Zero. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased. I'm really delighted to be here. We're going to cover a lot. Uh, I kind of want to move fast-paced because uh, we could talk about so much. But let's, let's kind of talk about you. We've read and studied you a little bit, and I would say you are one of the few that are optimistic uh, as you think about climate change. How can you be optimistic when we have such an apocalyptic times? So I would argue we're not in apocalyptic times. I think we are in times of uncertainty and we're seeing the impacts of climate change. You know, there's really no place in the world where you're not seeing the impacts and the influence of climate change. The reason why I don't take a kind of a doomsday attitude is one, I'm an educator, so I work for young people. I see a lot of hope in what, what they want to do and what they are doing. I also see tremendous amounts of uh, technological change that are you know, impacting and influencing um, how we think about managing climate change. I also don't believe that we're going to solve climate change. I just believe that we are going to get better at managing and thinking about how we have a portfolio of solutions. You know, I talk often that I do think we can achieve net zero by 2050, that a combination of innovation, and by the way, innovation upon innovation all the way till 2049.9 and but between innovation and collaboration we're going to get there mm -hmm. you 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 kind of talk about we're going to just all you kind of share a similar view maybe stated differently but that it is optimistic because now we're talking about it now we're measuring it we can get there I do believe we can get there. Uh, I guess I'm a little apprehensive about 2050, but that doesn't mean that we can't get there by 2050. I think if a lot of things align, we can get much closer. And I think it's really important to kind of look back. If we were to look back 15 years ago and nothing had been done and we weren't at that point thinking and doing and taking action about around climate change, we'd be much worse off than we are now. So. Again, I look at it and it's very iterative and it's not going to happen as quickly as we may hope or wish for, but it's, we are seeing change and we are a very large, I look at the way that the world is, it's a very complex world, it's a very diversified world, uh, many different countries, many different uh, contexts to work with, so. Mm -hmm. well, let's, let's go back to your day-to-day -day job as the Dean. Um, Energy, Climate Justice, and, sustain and Sustainability Lab. That's the work you do. Um, but, you know, you've had a long career there. So maybe just talk a little bit about your teaching, your research, and maybe even the work of the, of the lab. Sure. Well, maybe I'll go back because I came into Columbia. Well, I, I came out of Columbia where I did my PhD, but I had done uh, my regional work in Russia and in Kazakhstan. So I was kind of a Eurasia regional expert and I still consider myself to have that sort of regional regional expertise and I had been sort of working and studying natural resources, oil and natural gas and it's uh, sort of how it was impacting political transition in that uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, so when I came to NYU I started to teach the, at the then the geopolitics of oil. So that was my first sort of energy specific class with the geopolitics of oil. And then I, um, based on student feedback and demands on energy, environment, resource security. And now the geopolitics of oil is the geopolitics of energy because we have a very uh, diverse energy world. And uh, in 
the spring of 2019, after taking students to Denmark and Norway, I came back with the idea of the Energy, Climate, Justice and Sustainability Lab, which we launched in 2021, but which is now under the direction of Amy Myers Jaffe, who is also a guest on your program, and uh, she had a wonderful time. And uh, so she's is. she's now the director of the of the lab. I serve as the dean for the Center for Global Affairs, and we have two master's programs: global affairs and global security, conflict, and cybercrime. So I do spend a lot of time thinking um, about security and working in the security space. Yeah, that's wonderful. You, I don't know when. I mean, I just got to go talk about geopolitics. And I, I maybe need to talk a little bit about you because you mentioned uh, Kazakhstan. We can talk about that whole Russia, but I, I, maybe maybe we'll get to China and come back to that. I'll give you I'll give you a chance because I really want to talk about geopolitics because it's crazy the convergence of of politics and energy. Well, let's first talk about you know Barrons. Um, I, 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 you have to devour uh, reading. I find Barrons has been a key part of my reading. I see you in there all the time. And you wrote about, your piece I read was about Biden administration's decision to pause LNG. Uh, what, and I've read so many pieces on it. What do, what do you think are the, maybe the politics behind that and the implications of that decision? In, in my reading and my analysis, it was, you know, I think Biden came into office with a very sort of strong climate platform to address climate change and two, I think his words were to transition away from fossil fuels. And of course, what we've seen over the last three plus years is we've seen record oil and gas production. So going into the November election to sort of show more determined action to review and look at um, the LNG space, which has grown quite significantly for the United States. I mean, the United States is now the largest export of liquefied natural gas, you know, uh, took the lead over Qatar in 2023. And to do an environmental review of future projects, but those future projects are still I mean, many years away. So the projects that are you know, expected to be built over the next couple of years have already have their approvals. Though, honestly, some of those may not actually materialize because of the economics. You know, as you know, it's, it's a very market-based system. These, these projects are multi-billion dollar projects. So if the, if the economics and the financing of these multi-billion dollar projects doesn't make sense or the market changes enough that it doesn't look like there's a, a strong enough export market for US LNG, then I don't think those projects that are currently paused would have seen the light of day regardless of the pause. Right, and they span decades. I think for me, one of the one of the struggles I have is, well, I know people line up against for or against natural gas, so therefore they can be for or against LNG. When we tend to say no, someone else's LNG is going. And at least my experience has been almost always someone else's LNG is definitely climate unfriendly. 100%. I 100% yeah. I, I agree with you. And that's why, I mean, the United States, we have, you know, we have stricter regulations, we have more compliance. You know, I mean, one of the things that my students are always really surprised at is that even though Europe has um, reduced its reliance and dependency on pipeline natural gas from Russia, it has actually increased its liquefied natural gas um, imports from Russia. And so Russia's not going to suddenly decide that they're no longer going to produce gas and they're no longer going to expand liquefied natural gas production. There's a market for it. And I think there's a market for it in the decades ahead. And so I would rather see the United States and U.S. producers be out there uh, doing it rather than players that are, are much less uh, compliant around um, energy, um, environmental regulations. Maybe too much in the weeds for you, but, you know, Boston now, now announced they'll continue taking LNG, but they don't use American LNG because the Jones Act prevents it. Do you think that will ever be to the point 
where we would waive the Jones Act maybe just for that specific application? Do you ever see it? I like that. I mean, from a very practical... It seems so simple. It seems so simple. And I, you know, you would have thought that it would have happened before. I think we'd have these periods where, oh, come on, the Jones Act has to be lifted. It makes no sense. This was an act that was passed at a very different historical time. It doesn't make sense given current conditions, but it's very political. So whenever I suggest that it's, you know, there's an opportunity, there's this window to have it lifted, people are like, mm, no, probably not. So again, it makes sense to have it lifted. I think a lot of uh, people here in the United States would, who see that it doesn't really quite make sense, even when you're looking at offshore wind, by the way, if you talk to, you know, developers on the Northeast, the Jones Act is also a real, pro very problematic for U.S. offshore wind. Yes, I'm active with Dominion. Dominion hurt, not only bought uh, U.S. vessels, they bought the company that makes the U.S. vessels because it's the only company that really is making Jones Act compliant work boats to serve their projects. But it adds costs, right? It adds- Total costs, so adds, adds immense costs. Immense costs. So again, for U.S. interests, it would make sense to yeah. lift. As we, as we are studying you and reading you and kind of preparing for this, one, one of the surprises to me was you're an expert on China. It's very hard to be an expert expert, but it's an area that, it's a country that I do study and I have spent some time in China. Well, you're a member and have been a member for a very long time on the Council on Foreign Relations. You're a member of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, so I think that's an expert. Um, and, you know, here we are, you, you've, you've written a great piece about limiting tech investment in China, but let's, let's just spend a few moments, because here we sit today at a time where now we impose tariffs, clearly going to some kind of a, for the first time, green trade war, if you will. You know, don't bring your electric vehicles over here, which are clearly would be at a lower price point, would, would be positive for environmental things. How do, you, how do you square all that? You're trying to move to a cleaner climate, but we're limiting devices that get us to a cleaner climate. I think it's such a fantastic question. I mean, it's, it's if we were completely agnostic as to where we get our technologies and where, where we get you know, our renewable energy components and the parts for the energy transition, then clearly China is the, the manufacturer that provides lowest cost as well as scale. Um, however, I think there is concern and quite, quite rightly concern that if we were to just kind of have an open door to Chinese goods around the energy transition, that it would flood, flood the market with, wouldn't allow for U.S. manufactured goods, whether it be electric vehicles or if it be solar panels. I mean, in 2007, 2008, the two countries that were the leads on solar panel solar panel manufacturing were uh, Japan and Germany. And Japan and Germany no longer have solar markets uh, for manufacturing. So, you know, I think it's a I think it's tough. I think if we were to be again going back to that idea of being agnostic, then absolutely we need we need as you know we need much uh, larger faster deployment. Uh, but I do think there is concern as to what it means for you know, the U.S. industrial base. And of course, the Inflation Reduction Act is very much kind of in, kind of a footnote was to the, you know, is that it is meant to outcompete or compete with China across what is referred to as the green economy. And the same thing when you go back to the national security strategy of 2022, it is very specifically stated that the United States will outcompete with China on these specific areas. Because you said, I mean, honestly, I, I look at Europe, and I was just in, I was just in Greece last week uh, with NYU students, and there's real concern as to what it means for European economies, because you have so many different countries that are seeing, you know, Chinese, you know, products both, you know, on the industrial side that are disrupting industry across Europe, and you see the German auto, auto industry being dramatically disrupted. Right. So, I, you know, I, I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's, it's a balancing act, right, to say what we need to do in order to achieve net zero, which is what we're here to talk about, 
But at the same time, you know, national security here in the United States, you know, has to be a consideration when it comes to. You, you opened the door for me, so I got to ask, and you didn't know this about me, but I'm obsessed with the German economy. Oh, and I'm obsessed with it because. I share that because I kind of am too. I find Germany is a really just interesting country to look at. For I follow their GDP by quarter and I follow completely the collapse, and we, I think we can discuss whether we think it's a temporary collapse or a structural collapse, but for sure what happened, in my opinion, is all of Europe made wrong choices on energy. The energy cost ran away from them. We can talk about all those implications, but when energy costs ran away, then two things happened. The worker wages were effectively reduced, so the workers needed to make more. The companies had high energy costs, so now they're no longer competitive. So I'm not sure that Germany will recover from that for decades. And, and really, at the end of the day, it's all because of energy. You, you want to argue with me on that? <laughs> I, I, I could tell that you, we probably could have a really good argument, but I, I, it's really hard for me to argue because I, I actually agree very much with what you just outlined. It, when I look at Germany, and I was um, at a conference Two, about a year and a half ago, and uh, there was a political risk analyst um, on the stage, and someone, and he, the question was, you know, what's the country that you see like most at risk? And I think you know we could look at many different countries around the world that are you know currently um, experiencing what could be you know great insecurity, fragile states, and he said Germany, and I remember being like 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 Germany. A manufacturing powerhouse. Well, and then, you know, as when you look at what what a weak Germany means for Europe and what what a deindustrializing Germany means, not just for Germany, but then for mm -hmm. Europe, I think the implications of that are quite um, are 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 to be are to be looked at, examined, and to understand kind of the domino effect of that. There's also, I think, an, uh, an underappreciated risk associated with demographic change across Europe, right. and what that means, and how countries in Europe, Germany being one, are being impacted by demographic change. That's not hmm. in their favor. So that's a kind way of saying, Tucker, it's a little broader than energy and cost. Okay. So, okay, but if we're, but here's like, and my students hear this all the time. So I, I'm like, you know what? It was completely irrational. There was no, it wasn't economically rational. It wasn't politically rational when Germany decided to announce that they were going to take their nuclear offline. To me, that was... When I first heard it, and I know it was shortly after uh, 2011 and Fukushima, and I, I understand that there was concern about nuclear, but that, from what I understand, I was in Germany shortly after that announcement, that that was already kind of in the works. There was the Green Party, the, there were the politics of decommissioning nuclear had been very strong. However, I, I do think there's a little bit of that lack of, not a little bit, a lot of lack of scenario planning. And so when you know, Germany was kind of walking into, again, I think they had a lot more confidence in uh, the reliability of Russia as a, as a partner and that trade would be um, a means for Russia being a, a good actor rather than being a nefarious actor as they proved to be. And, you know, so they got caught with, you know, kind of becoming very dependent on Russian piped gas, which was also cheaper and meant it was cheaper for German industry to run its industries. But you, you know, again, you also have, you know, even if you look at the north, you, Tucker, you, you know, offshore wind, you still couldn't build a transmission line down the middle of Germany, right. even to this day, even though there's been a lot of movement, strong support for, for renewable energy, and you know the energy venda, you still have a lot of contention around transmission lines, and you have German heavy industry is located in the south. They need they need energy. They need cheap energy or cheaper energy. And so you know Russia's invasion of Ukraine 
reinvasion of Ukraine, I think, has been really massively disruptive. I think you're optimistic if you think it's um, it's redeemable, because I'm not sure if even decades will be. It's. I think it's really hard to imagine a, a kind of a a turning around. Interesting. Well, the only reason why I say that is because again, you have the United States taking much more, much bolder. Um, positions around industrial policy, right. and you have then, you know, you have China. China's, you know, digging its heels in terms of its own industrial policies, and so, you know, Europe has, I mean, especially a country like Germany, they have very sort of high rates for, uh, you know, wages expectations. Right. So I don't know. We could talk about it for days. So I better I better move on, but we'll we'll flag that for another day. Not, but, I haven't been giving short answers. But <laughs> no, but let's let's walk into that because I think you walked right in. Now we've established not only I, I'm glad you're a German expert, uh, but you can't, I'm a German. I'm, I watch I watch Germany because I find it very interesting. I find it, and I'm surprised that more Americans don't watch it because it seems to me the perfect harbinger of what's to come. Do this, do this. These come together. And a whole nother conversation. But let's talk about the last piece of this because you just walked into it. We can all agree, I think, that the void created in Germany will be filled by someone else. You talked about Inflation Reduction Act and you know our willingness to become stronger. And we're clearly seeing a bunch of foreign investment come into the US. But when, it, when we come to batteries, mining, minerals, processing of those mining and minerals, I'm of the opinion that it that China may have almost won the battle. That there's no amount of investment that's going to allow American mines to to mine, process, and build things that are that dirty. That we've we've almost lost the battle, and the only battle that now we need to fight is what is the next style of energy storage. And let's win that because we're not going to win the battle of batteries. So I'm smiling because I like to disagree to agree, but I have to agree. So I am very, um, I'm not optimistic about the possibility that the United States can either catch up or surpass China when it comes to the um, extraction and the processing of critical minerals. Um, you know, the United States once was a mining country. We are no longer a mining country. And maybe rightfully so. Mining is horribly well, you know, dirty. I mean, it's, it's interesting. A couple of years ago when I raised this, um, and I just happened to be in a room with a lot of lawyers, and, you know, someone, you know, someone said, well, isn't that a good thing that the United States, we can, you know, we can, we can move that dirty extraction out of the United States. And it doesn't have to happen in the United States, but we can we can sort of read the, the, the processed side of it. That's absolutely fine. But then I think where we run into the problems is when we are, you know, kind of going head to head against China. If China wants to put higher tariffs, if China wants to make it more difficult for us to access, then of course that's going to have its own sort of ripple effects on our ability to produce batteries. But I think, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I believe technology and innovation and the pace with which we are innovating could offer an opportunity that we could, you know, have alternatives to the way that we think about our batteries today. Right. That's, but that's not, that's not happening tomorrow. But no, I don't think the inflation reduction, I think the Inflation Reduction Act is sort of helping a lot of areas to um, support um, renewable energy Technologies, but I think in some in some places, whether it be around the production of batteries, the production of electric vehicles in the United States, I think it's much harder because of the inputs and the right. supply chain side of it. And for me, it would appear I, I say this all the time. I think five years before Russia reinvaded Ukraine, I, I like the way you say that. I could have told you that the Russian natural gas Nord Stream, Nord Stream Two were bad for Europe. Now, the scenario I envisioned wasn't the scenario that unfolded. My, it was different, but the end result was the same. Uh, Europe horribly impacted negatively by 
the failure of what they relied on for their primary energy. As I sit here today, I would say I think I see it in the U.S. even worse that we are making all of these decisions that are directly reliant on Chinese interests and Chinese minerals and Chinese batteries. And the parallel to me is scary. And I don't really see the answer, but I find right now we're over-reliant on Chinese technology. Well, I, again, I think if you follow Steve Levine, who's the um, editor of The Electric, and he covers batteries and he covers electric vehicles, you know, he said, you know, his, his ten, China is 10 years ahead of us. There's no way we catch up. So I think it's if we find, you know, if we rely on different batteries, if we rely on some of the things that we're seeing in terms of coming out of other countries that, you know, kind of the French shoring that we're, we're trying to do, but that um, we cannot, we cannot completely decouple from China across the supply chain for these critical, you know. Yeah, love your thoughts on that, thanks. Let's just move on. Um, you made uh, comments in an, another interview, and I was glad to see that you did it because I'm not quite sure sometimes I understand it, but that you, you were optimistic about that we would decarbonize hydrocarbons, that, which is in a, in, and you said it, we really clearly thought hydrocarbons would not be eliminated. Kind of expand on that for us, will you? Again, I teach the geopolitics of energy, so this is something I explain to my students every year. I mean, since I've been teaching geopolitics uh, since 2005, every year on year, except for you know 2020, we've seen an increase in oil and gas production for the most part, especially oil production. So it's either one or one and a half percent per per year. And so, One and a half percent last year. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, when I started teaching, I think we were just hovering around the 70, high 70, 80 million barrel per day mark. And now we're, you know, 102, 103 million barrels a day that the world uses. So we're not going to quickly transition away from oil and natural gas. And again, every year we're also seeing more natural gas uh, consumed in the world and Again, I think it's really important that to for your you know for your for your audience to just also recognize that you may see you may see a reduction in oil and natural gas in more of the developed world, but in developing economies you're seeing you know more demand, and so given that, and I'm a pragmatist, given that I see opportunities, and I also, I also already see it happening in the United States is that carbon emissions from oil and U.S. oil and gas production is coming down. So when you look across the energy production scape, we're actually, in fact, the United States has seen, we're producing less carbon emissions across energy production. And so given that the world is not quickly moving away from oil and natural gas, kind of goes back to your earlier point, um, if it's not the United States producing, it's probably going to be a dirtier producer. Saudi Arabia is not, and I think Saudi is a is a is a relatively very efficient, low carbon producer. And by the way, there's a whole branding around low carbon oil and natural gas um, that Saudi uses. Um, I think you see that in the United Arab Emirates as well, ADNOC. Uh, so you know, I think if, given the United States, given the innovation, I think given the extraordinary innovation we've seen in oil and natural gas production. In the United States and with carbon capture, um, with direct air capture, I think we're going to see more and more of that sort of space for more decarbonized, not, complete, not completely decarbonized oil and natural gas, but more decarbonization across that space. Yeah, completely share that view. And I find it interesting that the oil and gas industry is so good at communications, but so poorly at communicating the good work they're doing there. And I think, I'm still not sure I know why, but I think over time, people will begin to see how, how many improvements are being made in less water use, uh, less methane leaks, lots. All right, let's have a little fun, because uh, we could talk for days, I can see that already. I'm gonna hand you a magic wand, 
you're going to get to use that magic wand for one thing in the next year that you think would have the biggest impact on climate change? How would you use it? Wow, it's such a great question. I mean, I would love to see sort of more, uh, you know, it kind of goes back to your, or what we were just talking about. I, again, I see this period for of kind of cohabitation, coexistence that, you know, as the world continues to use fossil fuel, but as we as we deploy many more renewable technologies and we get some of the politics and some of the antagonism and some of the opposition out of the picture so that we can see, um, you know, greater deployment of, of the renewable energy technologies that we need. I think the politics are so um, uh, contentious, honestly, that I would like to see less contention and more, you know, cooperation. And I think that would be, um, and I, I don't think it's just here in the United States. I think it's in many different parts of the world that we um, need to see a much greater amount of investment, but a much greater easy, ease of the, in the pathways to getting deployment, uh, deployment, you know, to happen. Great use of your wand. One other tradition we have is to plant a tree in a national forest in honor of your time, your expertise, wonderful conversation. Is there a place you would love us to plant a tree? I live on the Lower East Side uh, in the East Village of Manhattan. I'm a big fan of our little parks. Um, so my first place would probably be Tompkins Square Park because it needs a little, you know, extra greenery. Um, but I used to teach up at Colgate, uh, at Colgate University in Hamilton, New York, and I love that part of uh, New York State. So um, maybe Finger Lakes National Park would be well, a special place. Well, your first choice would be in the East Village. <laughs> well, it's close, and I can appreciate it. We'll, we'll, we'll work to that. It's a great choice and two beautiful places. I've been to both, actually. Um, Anything else that you love to tell our listeners on Path to Zero? Well, first of all, I love the work that you're doing. I love the fact that you're bringing this to your audience. I think it's, um, I am a, such a fan of like learning and studying energy. And I find it to be forever fascinating. And I, it's one of the things I try to do in the classroom um, is to kind of encourage that kind of enthusiasm and passion to both, you know, understand our very complex energy world, but also to get involved. So thank you for the work you're doing. I think it's wonderful. Well, it's very kind of you. Thank you. And thank you so much. It's a fascinating conversation. The work you're doing is, is so important. Uh, bridging, you know, just the the bridges that we need to talk about. So great. Thanks for being with us on Path to Zero. Thanks, Tucker. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you for listening to a special edition of Path to Zero with Tucker Perkins. If you like what you've heard, subscribe and rate us on your favorite podcast app. You can email us with questions or comments to path to zero at propane.com.